Uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are and uh, where you're joining us from. Um, voy a comenzar muy brevemente en castellano. Uh, mi nombre es Magdalena Ugarte, soy profesora asistente. I'm going to start very briefly in Spanish. My name is Magdalena Ugarte. I work in Toronto, Canadá, in a university. This presentation, I'm going to make it in English to be in line with our presenter, but we have simultaneous presentation in Spanish. Um, on behalf of the research group on intercultural processes in architecture, urbanism, and territory at Universidad de Concepcion, I would like to welcome you all to the first international seminar, Decolonizing Urban Territories processes of state colonization and indigenous resistance, which is possible thanks to the support of Chile's National Agency for Research and Development, ANID. My name is Magdalena Ugarte. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Urban and Regional Planning at X University, formerly known as Ryerson University in Toronto, Canada. And I will be the moderator for today's keynote session. Uh, well, as you know, this seminar is the result of an open call made to researchers, scholars, and activists working in different contexts uh, with a colonial history uh, with the goal of creating a space for discussion about the diverse processes of dispossession and internal colonialism experienced by indigenous peoples worldwide, uh, many of which are enabled by mechanisms of urban production yeah, but it's also a space to reflect on the diverse forms of resistance and reorganization indigenous peoples are leading uh, within and beyond cities. And, and in this first day of the seminar, we've learned from presenters speaking from Walmapu, Mapuche territory, uh, about indigenous experiences in Bolivia, about uh, Bedouin governance in Palestine and Israel, and also about indigenous policy at the municipal and the national level um, in Chile. And we've heard about the close interconnections between urbanization and military processes of territorial expansion and settler colonialism, which are inseparable, as we know, from economic processes of capital accumulation. Um, but we've also heard about the disputes for the continued existence of other forms of living and existing on the territories which contest the imposition of boundaries that extend forms of mobility that predate the configuration of the modern nation states. And overall, all of the presenters um, have really highlighted the complexity of these processes of urban formation, which show parallels across contexts, but they have also helped us see uh, the need to really consider the particular historical trajectories and how um, they change the meaning of what uh, indigenous dispossession and resistance mean in different places. So to conclude this inaugural day of the seminar, it is my great pleasure to welcome and introduce our keynote speaker um, and someone who's personally influenced my own intellectual trajectory in important ways, Professor Libby Porter, who will deliver the lecture property and the precarities of dwelling in the settler colonial city. So let me introduce, try to summarize Professor Porter's uh, vast trajectory. Uh, Professor Porter uh, leads research in the Center for Urban Research at RMIT University in Melbourne, Australia, where she also teaches sustainability and urban planning. Dr. Porter is a planner, uh, an urban geographer, and a prolific scholar whose research spans the politics of urban land, property rights and dispossession, critical urban governance, and decolonizing urban planning. She's a co-convener of the Critical Urban Governance Research Program at RMIT University and also the program manager for the Bachelor of Urban and Regional Planning. Professor Porter has held academic appointments in the United Kingdom and Australia. She's also a fellow of the Higher Education Academy. And prior to her academic life, she worked in urban planning and, and policy applied research uh, at different levels of government, government in, in Australia. Um, she's also engaged in, in as an, one of the assistant editors for Planning Theory and Practice. She's a co-founder of um, Planners Network UK and then the author of numerous journal articles and, and books, 
including unlearning the colonial cultures of planning, planning for coexistence, recognizing indigenous rights through land use planning in Canada and Australia, co-authored with Janice Berry, and planning in indigenous Australia from Imperial Foundations to Postcolonial Futures, co-authored with Sue Jackson and Lewis Johnson. Um, so as a whole, Dr. Porter's work engages critically with the tensions of thinking about decolonization from within disciplines that have been and uh, still are complicit with indigenous dispossession. So I can't think of a better way of wrapping up today's conversation. So please uh, let's welcome Professor Olivia Porter. Uh, after the presentation, as you know, we'll have ample time for questions and conversation. So over to you, uh, Libby, so you can share your screen. Gracias, uh, Magda. Thank you so much for a beautiful introduction. Um, it's wonderful to be here with you. And um, actually, it's just wonderful to be here uh, with um, three people who um, I've learned a lot from, uh, who I've known since their PhD uh, days, Magda herself, Mauro and uh, Matt, of course, as well. So it's wonderful to be uh, talking to you um, this morning, for me this morning. I don't know what time it is where, where you all are. Let me uh, share this screen. Hopefully this works. You can see this okay, folks? We're good? Yes. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and translators do, um, or Matt, tell me if I'm too fast uh, for, the, for the translators to work with. So thank you for that wonderful introduction and the opportunity to speak with you. Um, it's a practice of law in the place where I am right now to situate myself um, and to acknowledge the truth of, of how I'm here. Um, so I'm speaking to you from the unceded sovereign lands of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung peoples of the Eastern Kulin Nation. Um, and the city called Melbourne, where I live, uh, is built on the lands of the Wurundjeri and Bunurong or Bunwurrung peoples. And I pay my respects to ancestors past, to elders present, um, to the people of country who have uh, always cared for this place. Um, I acknowledge and honor country, um, the life world that sustains me and my family in this place. Uh, and to indigenous peoples uh, here today, my respects to you um, and to all uh, people who are surviving in the face of colonial harm. Um, my respects and solidarity with you. So making an acknowledgement of, of in a truthful way like this um, that, I, that I hope I'm doing uh, is so very important. Um, and I want to, um, I guess, expose and explore some, some fairly ugly truths um, of the place where I am. I'm an uninvited guest here, a coloniser. I'm living on lands stolen for my benefit um, at the very great cost of um, Indigenous bodies. I'm working in an institution and a scholarly discipline that has historically and today subjugated, ignored and violently co-opted Indigenous knowledges again, in ways that directly benefit me. So my understanding of this practice of acknowledgement is not just as mere symbol, um, but a practice of a lawful relationship with the sovereignty that has always been here, um, and a statement, um, in, in part at least, um, of my commitment to tr truth telling. So these, these ugly truths that allow me to be here and talk to you from this position um, are also written into the urban landscape um, all, all around where I'm currently sitting um, in my home speaking with you. Uh, and it's to three particular kinds of sites that I want to turn to um, and explore these ugly truths for what they teach us about uh, what I want to call the precarities of dwelling and how these operate in the settler colonial city and how they're produced. And while all these sites are located here in Melbourne, um, I think they'll speak to other kinds of places familiar to many of you. Um, and as I, I give this presentation, I want to acknowledge um, the work of so many others, um, too, too many people to name here, uh, but people who are my colleagues, um, my intellectual guides, um, people who don't know me, but whose work I rest on so much, um, many of you might be here, um, whose thinking so much informs my own. Um, and just a, a reminder, I guess, that 
that none of us in scholarly work or in activist work for that matter um, are thinking and operating in isolation on our own terms but always um, in communities and collectives of scholarship and action so while my name might be the keynote um, th this is this is not just my work we're, we're all um, there's so many people who have informed this work so I just want to acknowledge that so to these um, sites of, of thinking um, in the city of Melbourne. Site, this first one, uh, site one called the Barrack Building. Uh, this extraordinary building pictured here uh, was revealed to the city of Melbourne in 2015. It was part of a large scale redevelopment of an old brewery site, beer brewing site, uh, at the top end of the city's main thoroughfare. And the face in the, in the front of the building, in the facade, it stares down the street and the face um, of, of the main street of, of Melbourne. Um, and the face is that of William Barrack hence the Barrack building. Uh, William Barrack was a, a Narangita, a head or a leader uh, of the Wurundjeri people who lived through the early contact period of colonization here. Um, he was alive during that time. He was a teenager um, when uh, colonizers arrived and began um, the process of, of wresting land, uh, his land from his people. The building itself is a relatively high-end residential apartment block. Um, it's a very striking feature in Melbourne's urban landscape, and it raises some really interesting and quite difficult questions about the nature of the relationship between Wurundjeri people and Indigenous people generally and colonisers such as myself here in Melbourne. Um, because this is what this is, this building, is an important leader and land rights champion. He was a, an absolute um, champion for his people, um, moulded into the facade of a private apartment building on land that was stolen from his people that has never been returned through the process of settler colonial urbanisation. And all of that has been done in the name of recognition and reconciliation. So this work of kind of making visible was central to the architect's intention with this building. Uh, I was uh, at a public forum discussing the building. En un foro público donde se inauguró para poder llenar este vacío, como lo decía, desde su fundación. En, en el 1885, la invasión de este lugar fue uno de los más known as Australia. The town of Melbourne was established, you know, smack in the middle of the, all the best places on the river, on important cool and meeting places. Um, food sources uh, were abundant here, but they were all destroyed. Access and mobility to land and food and, and, and all of the places that made a home um, were profoundly um, affected. Disease and murder, of course, decimated um, Wurundjeri and the Kulin Nation population here. Uh, and Wurundjeri people um, and Aboriginal people generally were heavily policed often driven through streets of Melbourne, um, such as in this picture at gunpoint, um, and, and by 1840 were prohibited from, pardon me, from coming within uh, 20 miles of the developing township. And that was a line that was heavily and brutally policed. Hence this picture of um, a, a kind of symbolic, you know, st Aboriginal people standing outside the city, um, the developing city looking in. And at this time, William Barrack was a teenager. So the subject of Barak himself and his life became this kind of selling point for the building um, in a rather archetypal move to innocence, um, as this quote shows, I think, uh, where the architectural firm is attempting to kind of smooth over the deep fracturing work and violent work of colonization with a promise of reconciling with deep time, um, rather kind of seducing the settler imagination with a, what I think is a false promise of authentic connection, creating an object to which we can point and say, look, we've recognised and reconciled. Um, we've, you know, in this quote that says, um, when uniting the city's modern heritage with its deep history. 
By making um, a big visual statement like this of recognition, one that is literally just a facade, it's just the external, external aspect of the building, uh, I think both reiterates and deepens what um, Goenpool scholar Aileen Morton Robinson has identified as white possessiveness. Uh, and this possessiveness is both of the land itself, obviously in the form of property entitlement that allows a city like Melbourne pictured here um, to, to develop um, and the de but also is the form of possessiveness that allows an arc a white architect to deploy an image like this as an intervention <clears throat> in contemporary practices of reconciliation. Um, because of course, recognition, recognition and reconciliation is not at all what this building is about. Um, hardly anyone knows who William Barrack is, um, and there is no explanation or identification given to any viewer of this building on the street. The foyer of the building is entirely uh, about a celebration of beer culture, because it's on a former brewery. Um, and the only reference uh, and it's a very strange one to the identity of the face. It sits just underneath um, Barrack's chin on the bottom of the building, but about three stories above the ground uh, is rendered in enormous silver discs as, as Braille letters, weirdly. Um, and it says, Wurundjeri, I am who I am. Um, and it is, of course, completely unreadable um, to anyone who reads Braille. So my point here is not just to sort of poke fun at architectural nonsense, um, but it's really to set the scene of um, the dispossessory intention and, and ongoing practice of settler colonial urbanization. And here's the kind of, you know, very slippery practice of contemporary recognition, literally writ large in an Australian city, um, deepening the extraction of wealth through private property uh, development from stolen land. A very different version of wealth extraction from stolen land um, is happening elsewhere around the city through the privatisation of a number of public housing estates um, in Melbourne. Public housing here is state owned and run low income housing, um, now very, very low income housing uh, for it's very much a residualised um, form of housing. Uh, in Victoria, there's always been a tiny proportion of, of state run low income housing, public housing. Um, Australia generally has never seen fit to properly invest in public housing. There's a very deeply entrenched culture here since colonisation of private home ownership, for perhaps obvious reasons. Um, and there's a sense that if you haven't achieved um, private home ownership, you have failed some basic test of your humanity. Um, so the, the sale of um, public housing and the privatisation of public housing has been a trend uh, in Australia for around 20 to 30 years. It's very much deepening now. Um, and what's happening is, as pictured in this photograph, um, public housing estates are being uh, decanted of people. All of the residents are being displaced. Uh, the buildings are being knocked down, uh, demolished and redeveloped, usually with a majority of new private housing and some uh, social housing provided by um, effectively non-government um, providers. Um, and, and this is all, of course, under the, the badge of urban renewal. Um, so in, uh, in Victoria, we have something called the Public Housing Renewal Program and a recently announced um, big housing build uh, that will redevelop 12 public housing estates across Melbourne that have been deemed kind of not fit for purpose. And it's very much um, a familiar story, I suppose, of strategic disinvestment being, so the state has always disinvested in public housing, and that is, uh, is used as a justification for um, you know, newly uh, valorising, newly capitalising on inner city land, on what is quite now quite high value inner city land. In Walker Street, uh, Northcote, very near where I live, where this um, photograph was taken, uh, was a, this was a low rise um, estate that once housed 87 families, very well located to services and transport, um, right on the banks of the lovely Murray Creek. And in fact, almost the location where William Barrack uh, himself, well, as a teenager, witnessed the signing of the infamous, um, called a treaty, but was never a treaty, uh, between um, early coloniser John Batman and uh, Wurundjeri people. Um, William Barrack was, was thought to be um, at the signing of that. It's literally at this site. 
Um, and, uh, and all of the residents on this site now, uh, in, a, in, a, in a recent wave of displacement and dispossession, uh, have been um, moved on. Um, I was going to try and show you a small clip from a film from some um, colleagues of mine who've made a film uh, about the uh, experience of the stress and despair and kind of violence of facing the precarity of being displaced from your home from your home at this site. Um, but unfortunately, they took the, the trailer down from the website. Um, I only discovered that yesterday. But uh, anyway, there's a film coming and it, um, it shows uh, many of the, the issues that um, are experienced by people living under the imminent threat of displacement, which is very much a reality for thousands of people across Melbourne impacted by, by this program, um, but also many more people sleeping rough um, with no prospect of state provision of housing uh, or bouncing between poorly suited services, short-term crisis accommodation, um, and this kind of apparent housing crisis is deepening as rent continues to rise, property prices rise, wages stagnate, um, and more and more people find themselves out of work or unemployed. Now, of course, abolitionist geographers have long noted the relationship between dispossession, colonial capitalism, racial capitalism, and carcerality. Um, and so uh, I, I want to introduce a, another site or set of sites um, of what I've called here sites of carcerality to think about precarity of dwelling in a, in a different kind of register. Um, here in Victoria, private multinational security firms are becoming increasingly embedded in the mechanisms of the carceral state. This is a picture um, of one such uh, new private prison that's uh, being built here in Victoria. Um, state contracts with private prison operators, of course, usually have a minimum population requirement. So it means that a prison has to be kept at 80% capacity uh, population at a minimum, creating a structural incentive to keep prisons populated. And the state through its uh, police forces has to meet that contractual obligation um, and so each party has a vested interest in a, in a continual and increasing supply of prisoners um, and hence we have the growth of the prison complex. So here in the state of Victoria where I live the prison population has more than doubled in the past 20 years um, and of that those those people in prison, um, despite making up less than 1% of the whole of the population, around 9%, up to 10% of those people um, in prison today are Indigenous people or First Nations people. And the, the most rapidly growing um, group of people uh, incarcerated in Victoria are Indigenous women. Um, the rate of incarceration of Indigenous women here has risen 110% in the last 10 years. And more than half of those women have not been sentenced, they're on remand. Now, none of this is occurring because crime has increased. Um, recent figures say the opposite, in fact. Swelling prison populations is a result of a broader policy ecology that organises dispossession and displaceability and literally banishes those bodies deemed displaceable and dispossessable into prisons or indeed to death. So new prison construction, such as a recently announced youth prison in one of Melbourne's most disadvantaged neighbourhoods, is dressed up in government press releases as creating jobs and stimulating economies, keeping communities safe. This is the kind of language um, of prison expansion uh, here in Australia. In, in the book, in a wonderful book, Golden Gulag, uh, Ruth Wilson Gilmore observed that in the history of the modern prison, people who lacked formal rights, and here I quote, um, rarely saw the inside of a cage because their unfreedom was guaranteed by other means, end of quote. Now, in early colonial Australia, those means were the regimes and technologies that I briefly mentioned before, being marched through the streets at gunpoint, use of net chains, spatial confinement on reserves and missions, ruthless surveillance through regulation. So we didn't need prisons for Indigenous peoples um, in, in that time. But since the period of formal rights recognition, the endurance of settler colonialism relies on our ability, our being colonizers' ability, to organise the unfreedom of Indigenous peoples through other means. So here we have the carceral state. 
the, the contemporary carceral state in which prison complexes, policing practices and criminal justice systems are like the sinews of the muscular political capacity of late colonial Australia. So prisons are literally generators of profit from warehousing bodies, extracting wealth from stolen lands and, and, and warehousing those bodies that have been deemed displaceable. When we sort of look at all of that from the understanding that um, as Chelsea Watergo would teach us in her recent book, Another Day in the Colony, that the Australian nation state is founded on the planned eradication of indigenous lives, lands, bodies, and knowledge systems and law, then this violent machinery of contemporary settler colonial Australia actually starts to make a lot of sense. Um, it's, it's deeply terrifying, but it makes a lot of sense. And it also links an, a, other apparently disparate sites of carcerality, where extraction from and destruction of Indigenous lands continues apace. So I want to frame these also as sites of carcerality. This picture um, displays a scene um, of around a year ago now, um, a scene that unfolded at the foot of an ancient and gigantic Japarung law tree in southeastern Victoria, um, a couple of hours drive from Melbourne. And the moment pictured here uh, had been threatened for many years because Japarung sovereign people had been camped at the base of their very significant uh, trees on their own country, on their own land um, for years to protect them from being bulldozed to make way for a highway expansion um, of the Western Highway, which runs just to the back of this picture here. You can see the line of cars uh, is where the, where the highway ro runs. Um, and that's a major road connecting um, the cities of Melbourne and Adelaide. The protest camp was also on Crown land. Um, and so the state had the capacity to move in. And one year ago, it did so, um, moved in and brutally removed the protesters, um, who were, of course, the people of country, uh, in a very violent show of state force. And while everyone was looking at this site where these people are being arrested, um, a huge and ancient, very, very important uh, directions tree was cut down, uh, thrown in the back of a truck and carted away. And I want to talk about these stories, not as mere examples of kind of the destructive um, aspects of colonization, but more uh, pointers to, they are that of course, uh, more pointers to this wider and deeper order of a kind of colonial logic that is intent on destruction of places and lives that hold together kinship, connection, law, ancient knowledge and community, all of which is about continuously creating uh, the material and propertied conditions of a settler future, of a colonising future. The Australian nation state applies these um, violent logics, um, of course, to Indigenous peoples, but also increasingly to other racialized bodies too, um, and particularly recent migrants and, and uh, especially to people asylum. Uh, it's the Australian nation state actually defines people seeking asylum as non-human, uh, and it, much like uh, we did to Indigenous peoples um, some decades ago. And uh, we subject asylum to a vicious and cruel regime of indefinite incarceration. And as Indigenous scholar Chris observes, um, this is just simply a situation of a settler state that has always relied on violent containment, her, her words, to create its own sovereignty on stolen lands. So we as colonisers, having arrived and taking up, taken over, have clearly stated that, and this is a quote from then Prime Minister John Howard um, in 2001, who said, and I quote, we will decide who comes to this country and the circumstances in which they come. A very famous quote he made, he was, uh, Howard was one of the architects of the Australian, the, the current Australian immigration detention system, which is one of the most punitive in the world. So this photograph was taken just a few minutes drive from my house, a couple of blocks um, to the north of me here, in a hotel where people uh, seeking asylum had been detained indefinitely, imprisoned inside hotel rooms. Um, and this system too is one, of course, where large companies extract uh, a lot of profit um, from human misery. People remain in situations like that, like this, uh, all languishing in offshore detention for which Australia is globally um, infamous uh, on, in places like Nauru and Manus Island, um, sometimes for, for years and decades. Um, and those, of course, offshore have no prospect of resettlement here. 
So detention centres and prisons and, um, and destruction of trees and punitive policy settings and, uh, are all um, flows of capital eternally funnelling toward extraction and violence and decay. Um, these are the kind of granular violences, I think, that are underpinning the contemporary urban experience here in Australia and, and of course, elsewhere uh, on the planet. And we could, of course, see them, uh, these kinds of stories that I've talked about or these sites that I've talked about as particular instances of urban injustice and, and that can be helpful um, but I really want to come at thinking about them uh, by learning with uh, Indigenous philosophy and, and theory from here um, obviously for a number of reasons not least of which is um, a practice of uh, and a commitment to centering Indigenous knowledge uh, and I say that not as something I am authorised to speak about but um, has as an invitation to learn with and, and theorise from so I want to sort of switch gear slightly um, and, and come back to these stories from a, from a different angle um, from understanding Indigenous uh, philosophies of, of ways of life here. So um, Combummery scholar Mary Graham states that the, there are some basic precepts of Indigenous philosophy here, here in, this, in this part of the world um, in, in two ways of thinking. The first is that the land is the law and the second is that you are not alone in this world. And these are her, her words and Mary Graham's words. And I understand this to mean that the rightness of the way we are situated in a relationship of belonging comes from place. It comes from land itself. So the land is the law. And, and secondly, that this way of belonging is fundamentally relational. None of us, whether we're humans or other than humans, exist separately. We are all um, implicated in each other's lives and non-lives. So we are not alone. We exist in community. We exist in relationship. Realizes this as an ontological belonging of first peoples. So belonging as being, as belonging as carried in the actually existing materials of flesh and skin and soul and law. Um, and so of course, this understanding and philosophy is fundamentally different from my own culture's understanding of belonging and, and of course is not something open to me as a colonizer um, or, or settler. Um, and, and These are the mainstays of, um, of settler state policy, and indeed they're the mainstay of urban research, certainly here in, in where um, I speak from speak from in Australia, um, but they cannot be resolved with those kinds of simplistic measures. So I want to um, sort of move into some ways of thinking with these uh, Indigenous philosophies um, to reflect on what I've been thinking about as um, understandings of dwelling, as a generative practice of becoming home, um, of staying put or staying with things, um, to so sort of use <laughs> Donna Haraway's phrase, um, and thus being emplaced. So thinking about dwelling um, as a relationship of, uh, of home that radically exceeds the norms of private property or a specific built form. It's not about tenure or you know, four walls and a roof. Um, it, it radically exceeds our, our uh, routinely mainstream, uh, indeed white, um, understandings of, of housing or, or a life well lived. Um, so I want to think about dwelling as a, a relational practice of being emplaced within a life world in a way that holds up the expectation of a life that can be well lived tomorrow. But achieving that kind of dwelling, like, like actually holding on and holding up, to use um, Sarah Keenan's terms, uh, that form of dwelling, requires the, the sustenance of being emplaced. It requires conditions that enable ontological security, of being sure that life can be continually reproduced 
each day and on into the future on your own terms. Um, and, and especially uh, that the relationships fundamentally, uh, sorry, fundamental to dwelling um, are continually reproduced because dwelling is relational. It's embedded in place, it's held up and inside um, rightful relations with place. Colonialism, of course, profoundly ruptures all of those conditions. Colonialism produces precarities of dwelling. It produces them deeply unevenly, of course. It doesn't produce precarities of dwelling for me um, because my body is expected um, here and its entitlement is expected here. Um, and, and there's a whole range of, of course, class privilege that goes along with, uh, with my racial pri privilege too. Um, but it does produce precarities of dwelling where the conditions of in place security for some are rendered unstable or uncertain or indeed are fundamentally broken or destroyed. So I think precarity in this sense is a set of uh, distinctive circumstances of our contemporary moment, um, what Lauren Ballant calls a set of dissolving assurances in her words or a cruel optimism in her words uh, about a life rendered impossible. So connecting back to Indigenous philosophies and the settler colonial condition, it becomes a bit clearer, I think, then that this um, that this uh, displaceability or unhoming or undwelling uh, is foundational to, indeed, constitutive of the settler colonial context, and it may in fact exceed just the relationship between indigenous peoples and colonizers. So when we come at looking at the settler colonial city, a city like Melbourne, where um, from an understanding that the relationships between people and place here have since invasion um, been structured through a racial regime of property that renders some bodies as those who will belong and other um, bodies um, as displaceable, able to be simply warehoused or banished entirely to either prison or death, um, helps make sense, I think, of, of this kind of context. And that work of those racial regimes of property affects First Peoples first, it affects Indigenous peoples first, um, and it continues to affect Indigenous peoples first. But it's also a logic um, that is organising other kinds of relationships too. Um, and, and I think that that's uh, sort of important to observe and, and understand as a, um, a way of thinking. Again, as Chelsea Watergo observes in her wonderful book, Another Day in the Colony, um, and, and I quote here, dispossession you see is more than the stuff of land, end quote. So dispossession in this sense is a severing of the relationship to the infrastructures, rights, capacities, materials and places that sustain dwelling on your own terms. And we can't resolve that simply through possession um, or indeed merely the provision of shelter or participatory processes or symbolic recognition like having your ancestor plonked on the front of a large apartment building. So I want to return to those sites, those rather disparate um, sites of, uh, of, um, of precarities of dwelling and ask what they teach us a little bit from this perspective um, to sort of think about how they produce and sustain an apparently endless regime of dwelling precarity imposed on an increasing number of people. Um, so the barrack building, I think, teaches us how the contemporary racial regime of property uh, easily deploys a veneer of indigeneity to further the extraction of wealth from Indigenous land uh, in a form that continues to shore up a sort of relentless promise of, uh, of a colonial future, of a, of a white future, effectively. This is more than a question simply of which person's face should have been on the front of this building, um, or more than a question of um, architectural integrity or um, procedural integrity that, you know, that might have produced the building. Because the continued extraction of wealth from Indigenous land is producing an interlinked system of precarities of dwelling, of which this building is simply one example. So for, for you know, another way of putting this, um, the continued expansion of housing supply, um, like that building, feeds a situation of severe under-provision elsewhere. In that sense, the classic uneven development problem um, in, in capitalist urbanisation. 
rents and property prices increase, wages stagnate, evictions are increasing because of the gap between the two and so on. And the barrack building is part of a structure that feeds uh, the revalorisation of inner city land, which then just ripples out, um, for example, to uh, sites that are uh, currently occupied by public housing, which suddenly spring into view um, with a deliciously large rent gap just sitting there uh, for the taking. And so the case of public housing in Melbourne, I think, teaches us that this is in fact far from a non-commodified or non-market form of housing. Certainly public housing advocates here in Melbourne, I am one of those people, um, and, and, and we have been talking for a long time in very unproblematic ways or unproblematized ways about public housing as non-market housing. But of course, public housing is still property. It's property that's owned publicly by the state which in, from an Indigenous perspective, from, a, uh, from a, a lens of Indigenous sovereignty, is an illegitimate state um, that still owns property. So the state, as a unitary owner, retains the right to decide to extract wealth from it as a property holding or as an asset. Um, and, and again, seen from the standpoint of Indigenous sovereignty, public housing, for its existence, relies entirely on the continued theft of Indigenous land and a continuation of that illegitimate colonizing state. So public housing is a paradox on stolen land for public in this context is a colonial category. It is stripped of the relationality that indigenous sovereignty would demand and make available um, and, and only is applied, the, the version of public um, to certain kinds of people deemed worthy and recognizable. So the sale of public housing to private developers, um, and it's of course wrapped up in endlessly tricky financial maneuvers with big finance and planning and architectural firms and, and so on, um, is, is a, of course at one level about building more market housing as a form of wealth extraction, um, but, uh, but it's always of course defined on the settler colonial uh, state's terms as to who will get to count as a body that belongs in those places. Um, and this rippling effect of displaceability and banishment that was first experienced by First Peoples here um, is being brought to bear on other kinds of classed, racialized, and gendered bodies. Um, and and you know, people are being, as I've described, displaced from their homes through forced relocation, displaced from the conditions that uphold their dwelling, um, uphold their communities and their livelihoods, um, and uh, displaced from the conditions that would sustain dwelling well uh, in, in the city. The expansion of prisons and detention centres and the carcerality of practices of policing and surveillance also feeds directly from and to this displaceability. Each is, of course, another representation, another instance of the further extraction of wealth from stolen land, whether that be by private companies running for-profit prisons or by governments creating the conditions necessary to remove and warehouse people deemed unworthy and remove them from society to banish them. And here too is racialized, uh, is a racialized terms of belonging and operation um, where increasing numbers of Indigenous peoples are imprisoned on their own land, are killed by police um, on their own land. Uh, and there's a kind of terrifyingly neat synergy here between banishment to prison or death um, of Indigenous bodies um, in order to re-coordinate Indigenous lands through the mechanisms of property to sustain that apparently endless um, extractivism. So by way of conclusion, I, I am finishing Magda, I promise, um, I simply want to uh, draw attention uh, really to those who've been speaking at these intersections for a very long time. Um, and here I'm, I'm, I'm gesturing and thinking especially of uh, Indigenous researchers thinkers, activists and theorists um, here where I am, but also elsewhere around the world um, who have been uh, attempting to ex and have been exposing um, those intersections for a long time um, and asking us, demanding us to examine those. So for us uh, and for me here in the urban disciplines, especially interested in city making um, and especially in places where cities are being made out of stolen land and on the backs of bodies deemed displaceable um, and, and deemed uh, to be uh, made precarious, 
there is much work for us to do at these intersections. Uh, it's work that has to expose and understand and carefully explicate ugly truths. Uh, that to neither shy away from those truths uh, nor allow ourselves to become seduced. And I think it's all too easy to do, particularly in, in academic uh, endeavours in, in academia and the university. Uh, it's easy to become seduced into work that sustains violent systems, that excuses violent systems, that shores them up in different ways. Um, and instead, I think we need to, and I know um, all of you here on this call know this, uh, your, your work is, is doing this kind of job, um, in looking to um, use our work to expose and undermine and work against uh, those violences. I'll leave it there. I very much welcome your thoughts and ideas and questions, um, and thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Professor Libby Porter, for that um, really provocative presentation, um, really thoughtful, so much food for thought. Um, thank you for highlighting for us, I mean, the, the mechanics of attempted Indigenous erasure in Australia, but that clearly extends um, and echoes the reality in many other settler colonial contexts. Um, but also for highlighting the, the problematic ways in which the special, the design disciplines are sometimes engaging or trying to, yeah, trying to engage with those, uh, that violence and those um, legacies. Uh, just wanted to highlight maybe a few threads here before we have plenty of time to open up for questions. And I think at the backstage, we are gathering here some of the questions. I have my own too, but I uh, don't want to take too much time with mine. Um, yeah, so a few things to highlight. I mean, the, um, yeah, this possessory intentions of urban planning, which I think we might perhaps be unable to escape actually. Very important and thank you for highlighting, making so clear those connections between historical processes of land dispossession and contemporary dynamics of in the many ways you exposed from disinvestment in public housing, uh, urban renewal induced displacement, the growth that we see worldwide, including Chile, of really a financialized housing system and the very intrinsic connections, of course, with the, with the prison industrial system, uh, which we here in North America also see very clearly. Um, so yeah, this transformation of the, the, the mechanics and the strategies of settler colonialism over the centuries, but that at the end are always um, founded on the what well Patrick Wolf calls the elimination right El this eliminatory um, spirit um, and really important I think the um, the reflections about these conversations being about mo much more than land while at the same time being about land but maybe expanding our understanding of territorial and land uh, beyond the possessory the, the possessive logics of owning and, and instead highlighting the relational dimensions of, of this, what you call like, well, or emplacement of the relationships that are only possible in close connection to territory. Um, as I'm waiting here, I don't know, because I cannot see what's happening on the YouTube end, if people are seeing questions on the screen, maybe I wanted to start uh, with, with one question maybe on, on the, if you could elaborate more on the on the notion of dwelling, I mean, dwelling clearly it's a, it's a lens that really it's a powerful lens to examine um, ways of existing and connections to territory that clearly exceed understandings of property. Um, well, there there are discussions. Uh, it reminds me of Anania Roy work actually and other people about the notion of emplacement as this counter practice against displacement. Um, it, and perhaps a question I have, it's um, also perhaps bridging the, the diversity of conversations that have happened today. Do you envision or have you witnessed any ways in which mainstream planning systems can engage in these kinds of conversations or is dwelling a framework and, and practice that necessarily exists, if you wish, in opposition to state sanctioned forms of organizing the territory? I think second, um, Magda, I, I think um, dwelling in the form that uh, I've tried to say a tiny bit about here uh, is in direct contra contra contradiction 
and, and contravention of a sort of state sanctioned form of belonging. Um, I, I think uh, certainly in, in the world of planning, I mean, we can really only think uh, the relationship between people and place in planning through the vector of, uh, of property, whether that be public land um, or publicness as, um, as process or participation um, because of the nature of our contract with, this, with the settler state, which is one of citizenship. So we get to have a say on you know, an urban development or something, but um, we, we don't get to change the parameters in which that conversation can take place. Um, so I think uh, that there really aren't examples and, and possibly there couldn't be examples. I'd love to be proved wrong on that, but um, I, I imagine that that uh, is probably the case because this form of dwelling so radically exceeds um, anything that the settler state could, um, I think, and the corners. No, th thank you. Thank you so much for, for that, Libby. I, I don't know, I would also like to open up um, to hear uh, people who are in the, in the room. I don't know if any of the of the other organizers or anyone here in the in the room would like to. I think Matt. Um, I have a question. I'll just put it in English. Um, it's also about the idea of emplacement. I, I like that uh, that the, the the way you explained the idea of belonging. Um, belonging not as kind of a flippant thing, not as um, just a sentiment, but as as a, a, a the law and and land, so very well um, uh, um, rooted in place. Um, but but also this idea of dwelling as in placement. And and I was also thinking of Roy's um, piece on this possessive um, this possessive collectivism. I think it is um, where where she's talking about. Um, poor people's movements, so so I, I kind of open it up to marginalized groups in general, that doesn't have to be poor necessarily economically, that just um, marginalized for different reasons, um, that, their, uh, um, that their only ca capacity is, so, so she's putting it, I, I understand it more as a mere emplacement, not as this, you know, this, this beautiful um, understanding and rootedness in place, but more of the only option that they have. She talks about emplacement as placing of a gun or positioning, you know, in, in a in a battle situation. So the, the only possibility is emplacement. I sorry. And um and uh, uh the politics of postponement. And that, that was what I I think about this idea of it's only extended temporariness and, and um, it's not permanent, you know, it's not continual. But it made me think that that is ultimately that's all we have all we have is extended temporariness what what permanent what permanence what is permanence in this life if you know you, you can have a, a whole array of a state you know processes and procedures to extend it more to make it look more um, durable but it's ultimately that's really all we have so I don't know if you could elaborate more I don't know if that's really a question but just kind of a lot of thoughts that kind of came together in a funny way um, while I'm trying to think through what you're saying it's beautifully put thanks uh, thanks Matt for, for that it allows me to open it up um, a little bit more, which is probably probably helpful because I, I didn't perhaps say enough um, or maybe I said too much. Uh, <laughs> who knows? Um, it, it, it's an interesting question. I think you're where, where you landed your comments there on you know how how can we think about permanence in a in a world and a life where we're, we're fundamentally impermanent, right? Um, and that reminds me of uh, uh, Judith Butler's definition of precarious, different from precarity. Precarious meaning that essentially um, um, vulnerable uh, way in which we're interconnected with each other. That that our being, you know, 
my being is, is precarious in the sense that it's related to everybody else's um, for you know my my health and well-being and the same for all of us so our our sense of self um, our continuation of self our understanding of self is precarious not in a negative sense but in a fa fundamentally relational sense um, which, which is a little like I suppose or is resonant with um, what Nick Blomley would teach us about property, that property is innately precarious because it relies on a web of interconnected relationships and networks of a whole assemblage of, of materials and artefacts and, you know, regulatory whatever ought to all be, to all come to bear in order to hold up a thing that we can call property um, and a set of rights that we can recognise as, as property sense is innately um, So that's really different, or well, actually profoundly different from what I mean by precarity, um, which is a produced um, instability or produced severing of the relationships to the conditions that we need to dwell. Um, th th for any of us, and, and they will be different for each of us, of course, um, and they exceed things like a private property title or a rental contract or, you know, four, four walls and a roof, such as where we're all presumably sitting in right now, um, and, it, and it exceeds um, states and, and citizenship forms and governments and whatever. It's, it's a different kind of thing. It's, a, it's an ability to see that precarious nature of, of our of our lives um, in relationship with others and yet dwell well in the face of that, of, of that being precarious. Um, and it, it reminds me a little of, um, here's another story to help flesh this out a little bit more. Um, I'm working at the moment with a number of people uh, who are not, uh, not directly displaced by the renewal of public housing that I spoke about, um, but are, um, their, their capacity to dwell is undermined by the lack of uh, effective provision of public housing in Victoria. Um, so two people who have been uh, sleeping rough, um, have, have, been, have experienced homelessness um, and who have been displaced or rendered displaceable by the state. Um, and they are both currently housed in effectively crisis accommodation. Um, and both of them in completely separately from each other. They don't know each other. They're just talking to me about this. Um, are, are now tossed in, um, being sheltered in crisis accommodation as being so violent that they would prefer to return to being home, to sleeping rough on, because at least it would be on their own terms. Um, and they would not be so subjected to violence of endless postponement of of not being heard um, of being rendered voiceless in a system that makes it look as if the, the, their choices are at the center and they're not um, it, it's a it's a deeply strange and um, sort of situation uh, that that I find difficult to to understand somebody says that to me because of course my own experience is of, of never having experienced a precarity like that um, and yet I really hear what they're saying what they're saying is to me in, in to put it in different terms my capacity to dwell um, or their properly is being undermined through the provision of actual shelter which, which to me is a very interesting thing. So it's not about the provision or otherwise of shelter, it's about the, re the relationality of being held up as a, as a proper person, of being recognised as a full human um, in, in those relationships of, of belonging um, that are being violently undermined um, by systems and logics and bureaucracies and regulations, all of these things. Um, rather than the provision of shelter. So this to me suggests that the, that 
at least part of the problem is not simply, you know, a housing crisis. It's something much more fundamental about the way in which we relate to each other and produce the conditions that enable each of us to dwell properly on our own terms um, in relation, good relationship with each other, in rightful relationship with land, with territory, um, and with the sovereignty that is that has you know never been ceded here. Um, so maybe that helps uh, a little flesh it out. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Libby, I don't know if anyone else had the hand up here. I want to make sure that I... I do have a follow-up question, uh, a little comment and a follow-up question, Libby. Well, when you were making now, elaborating a bit more, um, I found really useful because your distinction between the notion of something being precarious as inherently fragile versus precarity as something that's manufactured in a way that, that it's deliberately put in place to create what might otherwise be considered inherently precarious without being. Reminded me of um, the conversations that I, that I think we have heard over and over again, um, thinking about Mapuche territory and the realities today of the Mapuche nation, um, whether in, in rural or non-rural areas discussions about poverty and the notion of living in poverty and, and Mapuche people in Mapuche communities, Mapuche thinkers, etc., and leaders saying, well, the Mapuche nation is not, well, it might be that it, people live in poverty, but there is a process of impoverishment. We have been put and were pushed into being an impoverished nation which is not the same because the, the, the framing, the ways in which we frame and understand these dynamics really shape our how we address what we see on the ground, right? And, and, and clearly the quote unquote solution from let's say um, someone who sits on the policy side of things, um, it's, it's not the same, the conception of something being precarious, housing precar precariousness compared to housing precarity, or in this case, like of a community living in poverty or experiencing high poverty rate versus uh, a community having been impoverished in, again, through structural deliberate uh, mechanisms. Which leads me maybe to the, the, the other question I had, and, and sorry if I'm pushing this way, but I know that you, an important part of, part of your point was this notion, these conversations, dwelling conversations exceed perhaps the discussion about land or at least our conversation about land in a possessory uh, in possessory terms but going maybe back to the question of land um maybe in a different way so connecting to ideas of land restitution and and i think well in for many indigenous nations i know in the way the the spanish literature has um and not the literature actually people on the ground communities but that has infuse the literature to the notion of territorial restitución territorial or recuperación territorial like land restitution territorial restitution or what in the anglo literature has taken more the shape of the land back the land back movement um in a way it's at the center of any discussion about decolonization so again going back to keep talk and Wayne Young, like if decolonization is not a metaphor, there, there are material implications. So if colonization, it's about land dispossession, decolonization needs to be about some sort of um, asserting presence on territory. So maybe if, um, yeah, perhaps if you want to elaborate a bit more on the 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 what the land restitution in a way means and how that practice and discourse infuses or connects to discussions about dwelling, which we know in an urban context where you, you were showing us Melbourne might seem um, more distant or if you wanted to elaborate more on that. That's a wonderful, wonderful set of comments and questions. Thank you, Magda. Um, you, you are completely right in, um, in re reminding us that uh, while dispossession is not only about land, it is fundamentally about land. It, it, um, land is at the kind of, at the base uh, or at the heart 
um, of the dispossessory intent and the dispossession questions. So, so the flip side of that is the land back, exactly as you say, the land back movement. Um, I think it's, uh, and just to say on your earlier comments, that difference between poverty and being impoverished, the, the process of rendering poor um, is resonant with uh, being precarious or being made to experience precarity of a, of a structural and intentional um, form of, of production of precarity. Uh, is different from, from precarious, and I think that that's important too. So, so thank you for noticing that. Um, the, the land, I, the, I think it's also important to distinguish between the movements for land back, so Indigenous-led movements. Um, I know Mapuche are very much involved in such things, um, and so, of course, are First Nations peoples here uh, in, in uh, so-called Australia um, and elsewhere around the world. So those movements um, for a decolonisation that is about land back are so important um, and, of, of course, where we you know, need to put our energy and, and time and, and, um, and allyship for those of us who are not Indigenous uh, people. Um, the way in which that movement gets co-opted into the discourse of the settler state and the forms of so-called reparation, you use that word, or restitution, by the settler respond to that another thing in time. Um, so here I think is where we get to this perhaps really difficult and interesting question of the ways in which the form of demand from sovereign seated, um, you know, we have this, this, uh, this very important kind of mantra, I suppose it is, um, from uh, First Peoples here, um, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Um, it's chanted at, at rallies. Um, it's, it's such an important principle because what it means is it always was uh, our, our country um, and it always will be. So the, the not seeding is into the future um, of, a, of a statement that we haven't gone away, that just in existing, we rattle the, the colonizers cage, so to speak, um, or, or quite literally sometimes. Um, so the ways in which that, that, that mantra gets translated into forms of reparation and restitution is, is a really key or kind of paradox, I think, in, in, a, in a settler colonial city um, or in, in any kind of context, particularly in a place like Melbourne. Um, so the only form of land back reparations that are actually possible in a city like Melbourne are uh, through uh, what's called native title, um, which is the recognition of a surviving form of um, indigenous title here uh, that survived colonization um, and can be you know, recognized by the, by the state. Um, the, the, the thresholds for um, claiming your, your entitlement to native title, if you're a First Nations person, say a Wurundjeri person, say you're a descendant of William Barrack, um, you've got almost no chance um, of doing that in Melbourne because of private property, um, because private property was deemed to, um, to extinguish native title with no consultation or discussion about whether that should be true or not, um, because uh, the, the settler state is so challenged, profoundly challenged by the idea that there could be coexisting forms of title, that Indigenous sovereignty can coexist with private property, um, that, you know, I as a tenant, a private tenant in this house that I live in, sitting on Wurundjeri land, can, it's possible for me to hold in view the fact that I'm a private tenant um, in a settler colonial system and I'm living on Wurundjeri land and, and that I recognise that Indigenous sovereignty was never ceded here. It's, I, I think it's possible to hold those things in view, um, except that for most of us it isn't possible, I think. Um, certainly for the settler state, uh, it isn't possible. So our form of reparation um, becomes part of the problem uh, because all we have uh, or all we're willing to um, imagine is structured through property, 
that's structured through the lens of reparation as a form of of newly minted possession. We, we can only deal in dispossession and possession. We can't think outside of that. Um, and I think that's kind of where I was trying to unpack a little bit more um, this sort of idea of a politics of dwelling that might enable us to see that one sovereignty was never ceded um, and that the, the practices of dwelling, of Indigenous dwelling in a place that can't recognise even that existence, but nonetheless that practice is underway. Um, nonetheless, that sovereignty is still here, is still unceded and will continue to be unceded. It's in that little space in there that I think is really important that we, we learn from. Indigenous people, they survive colonisation, and I don't mean survive in the reductive sense. I mean they survive in the face of it, um, and, and that practice of surviving is kind of what I mean by this ability to dwell. Um, all of the conditions of it are, are profoundly constrained and, and sometimes destroyed and whatever, and yet, and yet, it is still being practised. Um, so, so I guess that's kind of where I'm. I'm going. That was a ramble, ramble of an answer. Magda, sorry. <laughs> oh no, zero ramble. I, no, everything <laughs> totally connects. I, I see the connections very clearly. Thank you. Thank you so much, Libby. In anyone else here in the room who has Pratichi, go go ahead. Thanks. Um, thanks, Libby, by the way, that was really thought provoking. Um, and it, yeah, speaks to a lot of my interests. And I guess when you were the question that came to mind was like, what are the terms on which we can dwell? And like, what are the conditions that allow us to dwell? And I was wondering whether you see the idea of dwelling because it deliberately um, doesn't engage with possession versus dispossession like I guess you're trying to move away from that sort of logic of white possession but I was wondering if like the um the idea of dwelling whether you see this as something that can bring different movements together because I think I guess I'm thinking back to other conversation the other conversation that I've had that we had the other day and about about how public um, housing um, redevelopment and the people who are living in public housing sometimes may not be you know that happy with the conditions um, of their housing and that, that's a case in Australia and maybe public housing estates in the UK where I'm currently based because of systematic neglect on the part of the government so in that sense like you, you know like that some people would not necessarily want to you know they they're not necessarily engaging in anti-displacement politics or they're not necessarily engaging in the politics of like the tenant who will not be displaced, who will fight the government, um, et cetera. But, you know, I, I think maybe the idea of dwelling can bring those people together with people who are engaged in sort of more anti-displacement politics, if you know what I mean, um, because it really opens up the idea of what um, dwelling is. And I also the idea of, I don't know whether this sounds good, but the idea of freedom also came to mind when you spoke about dwelling in terms of agency, the idea to sort of define the world on your own terms um, comes from a lot of Indigenous act activism. And yeah, I mean, I think it's quite a powerful, yeah, it's quite a powerful concept. Um, but I was wondering if it can sort of unite, yeah, whether you see it something that can do unifying work. Thanks, Pratichi. That's a lovely question. And um again uh, reminds me to make these connections uh, so um great that you that you raised that uh, yeah I, th I think it possibly can I, I hadn't thought about it uh, in the terms of connecting movements but that I, I imagine that that could well be possible um and so thank you for that suggestion um, I'll, I'll ponder that a little more um I think the the concept of dwelling but by the way is is of course not mine um it's, lots of people have written a radical politics of dwelling amazing paper by um uh, Michele Lancioni on it uh so you know that, that's not a, I'm not at all saying this is this is my idea uh I'm just working with it as a concept because I think it does exactly uh, as you suggest it it opens out um ways of thinking about 
um, in being emplaced, um, which we have in our, in urban, I think, um, reduced to questions of say, you know, housing. So we talk about being a housing researcher, which by the way, I don't think I am, um, because that's the only category we have to talk about matters that relate to being emplaced. That's the only language we have um, is the language of housing. And yet it's fundamentally inadequate to capture what it means to dwell because our practice of dwelling, of living in the world, so exceeds our housing, the form of the house or the tenure in which we hold it. Um, and, and so I think that, that that link is terribly important. Um, and, and exactly as you say, also opens out um, the prospect of thinking about the relationship between being, say, unhoused or unhomed, displaced, and being stuck in a situation that um, is, is not, uh, where, where you're being displaced from the conditions that are, enable you to dwell well, right, in place, um, but haven't actually geographically displaced you to somewhere else. You, you might be stuck, um, and many, many people are stuck, as you've described, uh, in housing situations that are deeply appalling, um, that are unhealthy, that are affecting, impacting someone's ability to dwell properly um, in all sorts of ways. Uh, and yet we, and yet that isn't displacement. So, so displacement scholarship um, in the, the, the kind of anti-gentrification or anti-displacement kind of mode can't see that work, can't see that, um, that practice of surviving by simply continuing to be in place because those people haven't been displaced. So the concept of dwelling allows us to make that connection with those different forms of practice of being of surviving in a world that essentially wants to kill you, um, wants to banish you to some somewhere else or to death, basically, um, and and it's trying to do that in these slow, subtle, um, and yet deeply violent ways, like just allow a building to disintegrate around you until you're simply exhausted or you know you give up. Right. Um, so I, I think that kind of Matt was talking before about that politics of postpone of endless postponement, um, that, that kind of waiting, you know, um, Oren Niftahel calls it grey spacing. Um, there's a you know so many terms that we could bring to this kind of concept. And I think that holds that in view. And I guess that's the reason as well I was trying to talk about um, those sort of sites of carcerality. So the expansion of prisons is you know, people, people who are incarcerated are, are, live, are dwelling, are surviving in the face of it, um, hopefully, if they're not being killed, um, which some of them, of course, are, um, and they're doing so in ways that if, if we think about it as um, the severing of the relationship to, to be able to dwell well on your own terms, we can see the prison system as part of this whole logic that's unfolding in front of us rather than another thing over there. Um, so I've been grappling a little bit with um, how um, effectively bring together uh, the growth of the prison system with public housing. This is a really struggling with here in Melbourne, no one really is talking about, but how to do that in, in a more, um, I guess, sophisticated way than simply saying, look at how much money is being spent on prisons. So it was $2 billion investment in the 2019 state budget in prison expansion. And at the same time, we're demolishing public housing. That, you know, those two things are related to each other. How do we make that link more than simply just the, the provision of state funds um, or, or whatever? We need, we need to sort of see how people are being moved in this system, how people are rendered displaceable within it. Um, 
moved from public housing to the outer suburbs um, and, and so on. I hope that clarifies a little bit um, in there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Pratic, for the question and, and Libby for the answer. I see Mauro. Eh, Mauro, I think you're eh, estás en silencio. Muchas gracias. Ahí sí. Eh, gracias. Thanks, Lili, for the presentation. It's nice to see it's been really long. I hope you are listening translation. I, I have a question, but more than just a question, I have a lot of questions. Just because of um, ignorance and, and also some questions I have. Lo describes un poco también, yo me quedé con esa sensación cuando que es un que hay como una Australia has this dogma on private property. That is very clear, you were showing us. And apparently, so the feeling I had that how there's no space to look for answers for indigenous peoples. You were showing us three, but beyond that, we had a talk earlier today that the state of Chile that is um, similar to the Stalin one under neoliberal, where also private property is a very strong concept. What I don't quite get is these gray areas. If there is a level of reorganization from indigenous the that is helping to move this and to balance the situation. If there is something, even if it's a very little so in all of the translation, right? Or did you receive the translation properly? I, I was listening to the translation. Gracias, Mauro, for the for the um, question. Uh, so, to your question about how many Indigenous people live in in Melbourne, around about I I, I just googled it while you um, asked. <laughs> about 24,000 people, um, about 0.5% of the population. So tiny, tiny percentage uh, of the wider population, if that helps. So um, in terms of scale, um, it's, it's, you know, very difficult for uh, Indigenous people here to be, to be even seen really, much less recognised in, in other kinds of ways, recognised as sovereign people, um, it, it's almost impossible to be, to be seen. So to your question on, I think you said, or it was at least interpreted as um, it's very vertical system. Um, I, I hope that was right. And, and I, that's my impression too. Um, it's, it's very vertical, um, but there is capacity, of course. I think there is always capacity to organise um, and people do organise, but in very different ways. Um, so the formal um, ways in which uh, Indigenous people are participate in the life of the city, if you like, um, or the planning of the city uh, is through um, a sort of form of cultural heritage uh, recognition so that they have some say over um, uh, new development where that might impact 
places that are special to them. Um, the example that I mentioned in the talk of the Japurung trees uh, that were demolished, uh, bulldozed to make way for the highway um, is a really good example of the way that the settler state uh, organizes that participation on its terms. So uh, it, the, the state claimed that it had the right to destroy the trees because it had the permission of some people in that community and not, not everyone in that community. So it's this divide and conquer, I suppose, um, approach to cultural heritage management that enabled that to, to happen. Um, so, so there's those kinds of things that are possible and increasingly um, uh, Wurundjeri people are involved in some of the planning mechanisms actually um, locally in the state. So um, I'm actually doing a small piece of work with Wurundjeri uh, Land Council um, who are working with the Victorian government department uh, in charge of land and planning and, and water management and so on, uh, on um, greater form of control, a Wurundjeri control of development um, in, the, in the growth areas of Melbourne, in the outer, outer areas of Melbourne. Um, so, so those things are important, but they're heavily, heavily constrained. Um, obviously, by private property, um, this can you know, only happen on so-called public land, but it will only ever happen on the terms of the state. Uh, and, and back to this uh, conversation we were having just a few minutes ago um, is, uh, is, is contained in, in, a, in a form of kind of endless bureaucratic circularity and postponement and grey kind of nothingness <laughs> that wraps people into, ensnares people to think that they're getting somewhere and actually just exhausts them. It just, it just reduces the, the, it just saps energy um, because the state seems to invite people in and then it just sucks them dry of their energy um, because they're constantly battling some bureaucratic procedure or a new law or whatever. So there's that form of, of participation. And then of course, there's what I would call grassroots organizing where uh, communities, activists are organizing against prisons, against the growth of the prison industrial complex, against brutal policing, against gentrification. Um, so there's a number of indigenous led, First Nations led movements such as Homes Not Prisons um, and uh, a, a, an organization called Flat Out here in Australia, that uh, here in Melbourne, that helps uh, particularly um, women fleeing domestic violence um, and who have been incarcerated to find housing, and it's you know off and it's led by Indigenous peoples. Um, so there's there's a whole range of movements there, and there's any number of um, strong, uh, staunch uh, First Nations scholars talking about all of these things too, of course. And the last thing to mention in the Victorian context is um, the Victorian state government is currently in a conversation with uh, Indigenous peoples here uh, about treaty. So we have what's called a treaty framework uh, and we have a, a uh, they've called it the First Nations Assembly, First Peoples Assembly, um, which is an elected body of uh, Indigenous peoples um, who trace their traditional um, connection, their belonging to what is now the state of Victoria, um, who sit on this assembly and are negotiating a treaty with the Victorian state government, um, which which is amazing because it's the first time in Australia that there has ever been a treaty conversation. And yet, and yet, but 
um, is so constrained by what the, the, the Victorian state government is willing to talk about. So it will not talk about land in that conversation. Land is land back is off the table um, in that treaty conversation, which for all of us who are interested in that form of exactly as we've been talking about today um, is extraordinary. And yet because it's done on the terms of the settler state, that's they can arrange the conversation uh, in their own interests. And it's not in their interests to talk about land back. Uh, so, so that form of, of truth telling is, is off the table. So I hope that gave a little more context to the, um, to the area. And, and also, um, I just wanted to say, I've just seen the chat. I'm so sorry. I've had two messages from, the, <laughs> from interpreters asking me to slow down. And that was an hour and a half ago. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Mauro, for the question and, and Libby for that answer. Um, I have the impression we are probably approaching the end of the session. Um, I, and I don't see any other hands up. So I think, well, start by thanking you again, Professor Libby Porter, for, uh, again, for giving us so much food for thought. Um, such a great presentation, but also the, the, yeah, the time for the conversation and for the answers. And, and again, shedding light, I think, on the, on the complexity, the really multi-layered nature of, of all these conversations, shedding light both on structural constraints and, and kind of like the undeniable uh, violence of the continued existence of settler states in, in, the, in the places where many of us uh, live while at the same time, um, well, continue to highlight the ongoing existence and resistance and re-existence of multiple forms of, of again, in indigenous law and, and indigenous practice and action, and both through and within the margins of the state and alongside and in opposition, which I think, um, yeah, open up spaces for rethinking and, 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 and some of the people here, I mean, I think we come from our respective standpoints, but I see people who are in academia, in community, in activism, in public policy, in a combination. Um, and I, again, I think in each one of these spaces, there's so much uh, work to be done, which you pointed to Libby, um, well, particularly when it comes to people in academia and institutions and higher education institutions in governments that have been and continue to be also the spaces of colonization and epistemic colonialism by definition, but where precisely because of that, there can be spaces for subversion. So thank you, thank you again, Libby. Great to see you and, and great to hearing everyone's questions. Just maybe a couple words. So tomorrow, Tuesday the 23rd, we're gonna start at, and I will say this in Spanish in a minute, <laughs> we'll start at 9 a.m. again. We're gonna have two panels in the, what's morning in Chile, one at nine and one at 11 with again, uh, at least six great panelists presenting their, their work, their, their research. And then we're gonna reconvene in the evening, same time as today's um, keynotes, speaker session with Professor Porter, but tomorrow we're going to have a round table and the launch of the video Gaza Artists and Desirable Cities with authors Haim Jacobi and Michelle Pace. Um, so thank you again. Brevemente en castellano, dejar a toda la gente invitada. Mañana comenzamos nuevamente a las nueve horas de Chile con dos paneles, um, con seis panelistas fantásticas y fantásticos eh, que estarán presentando y después en la tarde, 5 de la tarde hora de Chile, una mesa redonda y el lanzamiento de, de un eh, video, un audiovisual llamado eh, Artistas de Gaza y las ciudades deseables con eh, Jaim Jacobi y Michelle Pace. With that, thank you again, Libby, and wishing you a good day ahead. And thank you everyone, and we hope to see you all tomorrow.